our family tries as best they can to stay up for the new year. And usually it means I have to take a nap. I fall asleep sometime in the evening and wake up in time uh, to catch that, that moment when the ball drops. Except I, I learned something this year that I never taught on me before. Um, we're watching the ball drop, and, and it's just like 50 seconds to go, but my neighbors are setting off the fireworks. Okay, And I'm getting a text message from my son saying, Happy New Year. And it's like, well, they're a little bit early. And then I realize that there's a delay on my television. And so <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, I get to celebrate 50 seconds later than everybody else. So. Yeah, is to watch that ball drop uh, and uh, the revelers. But there's something that has caught my attention uh, that I really dislike. Uh, there, there's a song, an anthem that's associated now with New Year's, with New Year's Eve. Uh, your first inclination is to think, well, it's all Lang Syne, right? No. That, that's an old one. I said a, a relatively new anthem. It's, it, it's now been a number of years that this is the song that is sung by some artist right before that midnight hour or as the ball is dropped. Sometimes it's, it's right around that moment. Anybody know what the song is? Obviously, you don't stay up till midnight. Imagine. Imagine by John Lennon. It's written in 1971, so about 50 years ago. Beatles had broken up by then, and Actually, this was written a year, a year prior to him writing this. Um, he had spent a year in uh, therapy, primal scream therapy. And uh, it's an interesting guy. He, he wrote some songs that, that are really dark, particularly about his mother and his father. Uh, if you know anything about Lennon's history. But then came this song that later Yoko Ono was also uh, attributed to having con uh, written a song. It was probably based on something that, uh, a work that came out of about five, six years earlier. But these people are singing this song, and they're singing and enjoying it, and I don't know if they know what the words say. Listen, imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us. Above us, only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Ah. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for. And no religion, too. Imagine all the people live in life in peace. Yeah. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will be as one. Imagine no possessions. I wonder if you can. No need for greed or hunger a brotherhood of man. Imagine all the people sharing all the world. You may say that I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will be as one. Imagine. You know, at the time he wrote this, Lenin's worth was about $200 million which is worth about $800 million today. Imagine, no possessions. I'm worth $800 million. Okay. 
He owned luxury homes in Palm Beach and in New York. You remember, he died, he was shot outside of his apartment in New York City. That apartment was valued at $24 million. His estate, by the way, continues to grow. Uh, is it the hypocrisy that bothers me the most? No. It's the despair. That, that's a song that has no hope. There's nothing. The only thing you live for is today. Live for today. There's nothing for tomorrow. By the way, I did forget to mention one thing that he had invested in 200 Holstein cows, which doesn't play well with regards to today's global warming theories. Cows create and help contribute to global warming. Uh, so I don't know how Greta Thunberg would like imagine. But it's, it really is a picture of despair. There's, there's nothing beyond this moment in life. And people are singing this away, they're like, this is wonderful. To begin a new year, thinking that it's wonderful that this year is going to be a year of despair and no hope. As I thought about that, but also looking forward to today, I, there's... Uh, a phrase that, that occurs throughout the scriptures, and James referenced it already this morning, that struck my, my attention, caught my attention, and said, as we begin a new year, I, I don't want to imagine, but I, I want us to think about a new song. The Bible uses this term, a new song, a number of times throughout the text. It, it, you know, James read Isaiah 40, uh, Isaiah 98, Isaiah, ni I mean, Psalm 98, Psalm 96. Uh, there's one in Isaiah 42, uh, you, you'll, Psalm 33. You see it in Revelation 5. You, you see it throughout the scriptures, this idea of a new song. The, the, the sample that I'm using this morning is Psalm 98. So if you have a Bible, turn to Psalm 98. I say it's a sample because it's just to give us a framework, but I think it's a framework that, that you can see in these other passages as well. The idea of a new song, it just means fresh, a fresh song. And, and whether or not what they have in mind is the, the song of Moses in Exodus chapter 15, that, that as that celebrated this song and, and God's deliverance, that we sing a fresh song. Uh, as well. Whether or not that's what's meant, I don't know. But Psalm 98, and as we begin, let me just make one observation or comment. Uh, some of you are very astute and have said, asked me in the last couple of weeks, what version are you using? Okay. For years, I, I've used the New American Standard. That's always been my version of preference or choice. But I realize that there are a number of folks who are moving to the ESV. And uh, it's becoming a very uh, familiar, common, popular translation. And so I I've been using the ESV. Okay, um, You don't have to run out and get a new Bible. Uh, you use the version, the translation that you're most familiar and comfortable with. Okay? The, the ESV does read a little f more fluid uh, than the New American Standard. That's why people like it. And uh, so I've been using that particular version. All right. Psalm 98. Make a joyful noise to the Lord is the heading. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation, for he has 
revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody, with the trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise. That's what I do. That's why they let me sing in the choir. Make a joyful noise before the king, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. Let's pray together. Lord, I ask this morning that you would instruct us through your spirit about a new song, and you would inscribe a new song in our hearts this morning. For your name's sake, amen. We're not sure who wrote this song. Uh, some think it may have been David. Uh, others think it's much later, that it may even be post-exilic, after the, they had returned from Babylon. We don't know the particulars or the circumstances about this psalm. But I, I think the psalm provides for us this framework for understanding this theme that runs through the scriptures over and over again, this idea of a new song. He, he begins with, oh, sing to the Lord this new song, this fresh song. When I look at the framework, there, there are three observations that I make about this idea of a new song that I think is pretty consistent across the passages that speak about a new song. Okay. So this one's the framework. The first observation is that the new song celebrates God's work of deliverance. It celebrates God's work of deliverance. Now, understand it in its context. The psalmist writing, he talks about salvation, he talks about deliverance, we may use the term redemption. In its historical context, the deliverance that he's talking about is a physical deliverance. It's salvation from his enemies. And so for the people of Israel, there's a celebration of God's redemption, God's deliverance from the enemies, whether that's the Midianites, the Philistines, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, depending on where you place this in time. The, the, the celebration is for this marvelous work that God has done in providing salvation for his people, the people of Israel. Now, the picture of that deliverance, the picture of salvation that you see fleshed out in Israel's history is really a picture of a greater salvation, a greater deliverance, a greater redemption that the Bible spells out as you read the panorama of Scripture, you read it and you see that there's something that God is doing that is far greater in providing a salvation than even Israel experienced historically. And I think that's the new song. It's a celebration of what God has done to provide and accomplish his work of redemption. The, the, the author uses a, 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 something called a present perfect, the idea of a present perfect, to describe these things. He has done uh, what he has made known. That, that, that these things, or this work that God has done, is something accomplished, but with lasting results, continuing results results. That, that it isn't merely, okay, I got saved and, and I'm, on, I've got, I'm on my way to heaven. Uh, I've got eternal life. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't have to worry about condemnation. No condemnation do I have to fear. 
uh, that, that that's my deliverance. The, 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 the deliverance God gives certainly involves that. But the, the, what God has accomplished really does impact us in our everyday life. He's provided freedom for us. And we, that freedom is from shame and guilt. And we talked about shame and guilt a couple of weeks ago. But it's amazing the number of people I run into and interact with who are carrying shame. Shame from things that either somebody has imposed on them or, or shame for something that they've done and done in the past. And sometimes guilt it could be false guilt. Again, something fostered on them by somebody else. Or it could be real guilt. But the marvelous work that God has done in delivering us is that he delivers us from shame and from guilt. When we experience the salvation that he has worked that he has provided in Christ Jesus, shame and guilt are dealt with. He sets us free from striving to be accepted. It's amazing, again, the number of people I interact with, from, from children through adult, who are doing everything they can to have people accept them, striving to be accepted. Now listen, everyone likes to be accepted. I like people to like me. I like people to, to think well of me. I want. But it's amazing what people put on themselves to achieve so that people will look at them and accept them. God has set you free from that. Striving and that work. Because in Christ Jesus, you are accepted. Amen. God has accepted you in the beloved. <laughs> what other acceptance do you need? You don't have to be striving and wondering, is this going to be pleasing to this person? How can I make them happy? How, how can I... Okay, can I do enough? God has set you free from that. He's accepted you in Christ Jesus. And you're free from the bondage, the slavery to sin and to self. That's what Romans 6 is about. No longer does sin have mastery over you. You're free. That, that sometimes when, even as a child of God, we start down a path that, that sin, that slavery starts up again and raises its head. We don't have to surrender to it. Because when Christ died, we died. When he was raised, we were raised to walk in newness of life, is what Paul says. When I'm tempted, when I'm tempted to, to think about that path again, the new song ought to come to mind. This is what God has done for me. God, in his marvelous work, has provided a deliverance, a salvation. The Lord has made known his salvation, his right hand, his holy arm, his powerful, sovereign hand and arm has worked that salvation for us. What more do we need? The new song celebrates that work of deliverance. And very closely related to that is this idea of the present. He, he, what also 
I observe in this new song is that it orients my daily life to a real hope. And I use the idea of a real hope to set up in contrast to John Lennon's hope, which didn't exist. It was only imaginary. No. The new song orients my thinking, orients my daily life to something that is real, a hope that is real. You see in verse 3, he has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. The translators have used the idea of steadfast love, his faithfulness, to try to, to capture the meaning of a word. It, it, it's a word that's very common that, that is used throughout the Old Testament. And yet, translators have a very difficult time with it because they're not really sure how best to translate this word. Sometimes it's grace, sometimes loving kindness. But here you see steadfast love. One of the ways that this word sometimes is seen and, and understood has the idea of covenant. God's covenant love. And, and that, I think that's why he says here, his steadfast love for Israel. That is his covenant love for Israel. That God would never go back renege, change his mind, forsake or abandon this covenant that he had with Israel. Now, as we understand the flow of the New Testament, we understand there is a New Testament, a new covenant that God has entered into. This covenant, called the New Covenant, You see it in the Old Testament. You see it in the New Testament. This covenant that God has entered into with us is guaranteed by himself. The greatest guarantee, the writer of the Hebrews says, is God himself. You can't, there's, no, there's nothing greater, there's nothing higher, there's nothing that can, you can appeal to above. God guarantees faithfulness to this covenant by his own nature, his own character. And this covenant was secured by the blood of his own son. If God goes back on this covenant, what does that tell you about his relationship with his son? Can, can the son and the father have a severed relationship? No. This new covenant is the guarantee of our hope. It cannot be reneged on. It cannot be broken. But that new covenant, again, is not just looking down the road to the future, that hope. It is also something that impacts my daily life. You see, that covenant love means that God's love for me extends to how I'm going to live tomorrow. What I'm going to face tomorrow. And none of us know what we face tomorrow. It may be a perfectly great day. Everything we anticipated, everything we expected. For some, it's going to be a day where you're really caught off guard. Or maybe it's a week from now. But he, here's what this steadfast love, this covenant love tells us, is that it doesn't matter what the circumstances are, God's love doesn't change. That, that as I may go through some difficult times, it's not because God has abandoned me or God has gone back on his promise. It is God taking me through the realities of life. John Lennon says, imagine, imagine that no possessions, no countries, not, you know, everybody's going to live in peace. Right. That's not real. Realities of life include those things that bring highs and those things that bring tears those things that are hard. No matter what the circumstances of life, when you think about the people of Israel and their history, 
God's covenant love for them included times of great prosperity and blessing. It also included times of tremendous trial, testing, difficulty. And yet God, through that, is reminding them that his love for them hasn't changed. The new song reminds us that God's love for us is steadfast. It's a covenant love. And it does look forward to something. When you get to the end of the psalm, verse 9, before the Lord, for he comes, there's the promise of his coming, and he comes to judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. Listen, we live in a world where imagine, the song imagines, imagines they're looking for peace, except the way the world goes about righteousness and justice and equity only brings more despair. Our hope is not in Washington, D.C. Our hope is not in a new mayor in Cincinnati. Our hope is not in the solutions that the world gives at Davos or in Scotland. Our hope is in the one who's coming. Because when he comes, he judges, he rules. That's the other idea here. He rules, and he does so with righteousness and equity with justice. That means he, he, he isn't influenced by those with money or those with power. His eyes see reality, not what is, but people are able to portray themselves as. His ears hear the, the truth, that they're not swayed by the tickling, the persuasive eloquence of others. No, he knows and he deals rightly, righteously with all peoples. Nobody, nobody gets a pass. It orients my daily life to a hope that's real. Lastly, the, the new song is universal in scope. Now, you see it here, where he talks about the, the nations, the, all the earth, and, and he's made known the salvation in the sight of all nations. But I want you to go ahead to that other passage that James alluded to and read for us this morning, Revelation chapter 5. Because there you see it really clearly. By the way, you'll also see these other two observations. These other two pieces of the framework. John, in his vision of heaven, sees the throne, sees the lamb, sees all the elders, sees all these things. Marvelous vision that he has. You get to verse 9, and they sang a new song. There it is. They sang a new song. And this is what the song entailed. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed the people for God. The celebration of God's work of deliverance. From every tribe, language, and people, and nation, you've made them a kingdom and priests to our God. He's oriented your life, your daily life, to a hope. And they shall reign on the earth. But there, right before that, every tribe, every language, people, and nation. The new song is not for just some people. When I use the term universal in scope, I don't mean universal, and I mean every individual, every person, but every nation, every people group, every language. That, that the song that is sung, I, 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 people will say, well, what language are we going to speak in heaven? You know, are we going to speak Hebrew? I don't think so. I mean, I, I wonder what the song is. I used to think, well, maybe it's the Hallelujah Chorus, sung in multiple languages simultaneously. I, I, I don't know. But the, the details of what the language is or what the particular, I, I don't know. But I do know people from every tribe, language, and nation are there. And they're singing the new song. 
that it wasn't just designed for the people of Israel. It's not just designed for people in America. It's designed for people around the world. And so as I thought about that and said, okay, what about this new song and, and how, how can I utilize this idea for this year? Well, this is what I came up with. The best devotional book you can buy this year for yourself is a hymn book. Is a hymn book. A song book. This one is called Hymns of Grace. It was done in 2015. And so it contains a lot of the some older hymns. It contains some of the newer hymns. Some of the ones that we sing here. Okay. And what I'd say is you take this or... You can use the bulletins over the course of the next few weeks um, and, and identify three hymns, three songs, three songs that you can make note of and you can become familiar with the lyrics. And I would say familiarize yourself with the tune. Not that we want you to sing it anywhere outside of the shower, but okay, there's something about the music there's something about the music that strikes the chord of the soul, that hits not only the mind, but the emotions as well. So, so learn the song. That first song is a song of redemption. A song that reminds you about your redemption. Maybe it's something like this. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed by his infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. The inside cover of the bulletin is a song of John Newton. Uh, it, it was written, taken from his diary in January 1st, 19, I think 1980. Uh, and it talks about his testimony, what God has done both in the past and in the present. But really it's a reflection of the new song for him was Amazing Grace that he wrote in, in 1779, the year before. A song that speaks of redemption. And then a song that speaks about hope. The hope that you have. Maybe it's the new one we were introduced to. Christ our hope in life and death. And then a song that focuses and calls your mind to global mission. That this is not just for me. This is for the world. Maybe it's facing a task unfinished. It doesn't, you find the one that, that for you, you can think upon. That can be your go to song in 2022. That will reflect the truths of the new song that is written on your heart. You're not limited to three, by the way. But start with that. Old, familiar, new. It, what you're looking for is the truths that are expressed there. And in a way that can, you can remember. Sing them to yourself. Make a joyful noise to yourself. Recall the marvelous works of God. The celebration of his deliverance the hope that he's giving you for your daily life and the mission that he's given you to take it to the world.